As we mentioned, our exhortation this morning will be provided by our brother Jim Horton, and his words are going to be based on the reading of John chapter 9. So if you could please turn there with me right now, we'll go ahead and read John chapter 9 in preparation for our brother's exhortation. Reading from John 9. As he passed by, he saw a blind man from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, It was not this man who sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with mud and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he sent, so he went and washed and came back seeing. The neighbors and those who had been there before, seen him before as a beggar, were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is he. Others said, No, but he is like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. Then he said to him, Where is he? And he said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees asked him again how he had received his sight. And he said to them, He put mud on my eyes and I washed and I see. And some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, or he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him since he opened your eyes? He said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received the sight and asked him, Is this your son who, was, who they say born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind, but how he sees we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, for he is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He is of age, ask him. So for the second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God, we know that this man is a sinner. He answered, Whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, I see. And they said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered them, I have already told you, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? And they reviled him, saying, You are this man's disciples, and we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Why, this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born in sin, and you would teach us, and they cast him out. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and he found him, and he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And he said, Who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. But the Pharisees heard, when they heard this, they said to him, are we also blind? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, We see, your guilt remains. This time we ask if we'll turn our attention to our brother Jim as he brings us this morning's words of exhortation. Good morning. I send to you the love and fraternal good wishes of the brothers and sisters of the Mountain Grove Ecclesia 
in Burlington, Ontario. And with respect to the comments I would like to make this morning, which relate clearly to the events of the ninth chapter of John's Gospel as recorded and just read in our hearing. Uh, I need to give you some context for this. A few weeks ago, about three or four weeks ago, uh, I shared these same thoughts that I want to share with you this morning at our own Ecclesia, and it was specifically related to the exhortation given by a young brother the previous Sunday. And that brother had shared what I thought was just an absolutely marvelous, insightful exhortation about the importance while we have opportunity and I'm reminded that phrase the Apostle Paul used in the fifth chapter of Galatians about we ought to do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith. While we are in a situation and we have opportunity to do that. And this brother talked about a particular issue that we needed to take sight of. Not that we had some roiling, difficult, interpersonal issues in our ecclesia. We are blessed with, I think, a, a, a period of um, extended goodwill and um, a climate of mutual respect and trying to work together to strengthen each other as we await the Lord's return. But the brother spoke to the issue of unresolved difficulties, be they large or small, that go unresolved between individuals. Interpersonal difficulties that may be small, but really need to be resolved. In the 18th chapter of Matthew, Jesus gave us instruction of how brethren should deal with significant issues. And uh, there is a sequence there. I don't think there's a time frame on how many times we should be forgiving. But uh, the exhortation this young brother gave was that we anticipate the coming of Jesus soon. And if, in fact, we have issues that have not been resolved, that we've sublimated and we've just, you know, they, they may bubble to the surface from time to time if they are uh, irritated and we just uh, don't deal with them and we put them away and he said you know if we are in that situation and he wasn't pointing the finger to anybody but he said basically if the Lord comes and we haven't attempted to resolve those issues we all have missed the opportunity to do so because if we are called to his righteous judgment, those unresolved things are things that ought not to be there as unresolved. And so his, his exhortation was for us to be cognizant of that and to work at making sure there aren't under the surface, festering issues that affect either our thinking and distort our spiritual mind, or maybe our brother or sister's thinking. 
And so I thought about this chapter in, in uh, John's Gospel and the context of it, and I want to talk about that in just a moment. And I thought for, because I was due to speak the following Sunday, for several days about what is it that results in our having difficult issues between ourselves, particularly if we are reacting to somebody's words or actions that impinge upon us. And it struck me that there are four words, all of which begin with the letter A, that are significant because they are, I believe, the sequencing that leads to our being offended or at least upset, distressed, uncomfortable, and we risk just, you know, not dealing with that stuff. If I ask you what the three letters AAA stand for, you would all say American Automobile Association. Well, I want you to think about not a trio, but a quadruple, AAAA, and it's not the American Antique Auto Association. Typically what we do when we find a difficulty between ourselves and someone else, and maybe the way they've treated us, we might feel slighted or whatever it is. We look at that behavior and inevitably we make assumptions. And that's a big mistake. And it's the beginning of four other or three other mistakes, all of which begin with A. We make assumptions about their motives. And we don't know that, but we, we if we're honest with ourselves, we kind of gather incidental, tangential things that have happened in the past and we kind of put them together and make assumptions that, uh, you know, whatever happened, happened because of some deficit or shortcoming on the other party's behalf. Typically what happens if we make those assumptions, and we all do, we think we know, but we don't. 90% of the time we don't. They are our creation in our own mind as to, well, I assume. Following on that, we typically make the serious mistake, either consciously or unconsciously, and this is not necessarily a conscious one, two, three, four step, but I think it's, it is the syndrome that leads to unresolved things. We make attributions. We attribute to the other party, typically motives or intent. And that's where we really start to get into deep water. It's hard to get out of. Because whether we are ready to admit it or not, if we make assumptions, almost inevitably they flourish into attributing certain motives or intent on the other party. Sadly, doing that leads to affecting our attitude towards that brother or sister. And the most critical thing is that if our attitude is not one of forgiveness, if it is not one of, of compassion, if it is not one of being tolerant and forbearing, it finally impacts our actions and what we do 
And a lot of times we don't even know that what we're doing is a consequence of these previous three steps of making assumptions and not getting the facts through simple, direct, face-to-face -face discussion, making attributions based on those assumptions which affect our attitudes and our actions. And we have in the ninth chapter of John just an enormous picture of how the Pharisees and the Jews fell prey to making assumptions and attributing to our Lord which in fact changed and cemented their attitudes of hatred towards him and their actions of eventually murdering him. I want to say two things before we look at this chapter. I said the context is important. If we go back to the closing verse of the great eighth chapter, the eighth chapter of John is the great debate between Jesus and the Pharisees. The terrific connection between chapter eight and chapter nine. But in chapter 8, we have this enormous debate that takes place between the Pharisees and our Lord. It ends with this verse. Then took they up stones to cast at him. They had gotten to the point where their action was to illegally, with no reference to the law, stoned Jesus to death right then and there. But we're told that Jesus went out of the temple and going through the midst of them, he passed by them and got out of that situation. They said in the dialogue in chapter 8 where Jesus talked about Abraham, it's interesting in chapter 8, Abraham is mentioned some 11 times in 21 verses, and Father is mentioned 17 times in those 21 verses in the middle of this 8th chapter. They said that they were Abraham's children, and they reached back 30 plus years to say something they had kept and festered with them all that time. We be not born of fornication. Speaking of the birth of Jesus to the Virgin Mary. And they claim to have one father and that they followed, followed God. Of course, Jesus with wonderful words you know, rebu rebuked that argument and said that Abraham, whom they claimed was their father, looked forward in faith to see Jesus' day when the promised seed of the woman would be a reality and when the one greater than Isaac would become and be the perfect sacrifice. And he said, Jesus said that Abraham saw that and he rejoiced and was glad. Notwithstanding that, these people at the end of this, this great debate in the 8th chapter want to kill him. Their assumptions, their attributions about him, their attitudes and their actions were such that we read in Matthew in the end of the 23rd chapter of the woes, the eight great woes that Jesus pronounced upon the um, Pharisees. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, now that killest the prophets, how often would I 
have taken you as 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 a father and as a as a hen would gather her her chicks and hide you under my wings. And the tragic words that followed Jesus' sad statement about their attitudes was the words, and you would not. And that's the great danger of ending up thinking that we are right and there is no room for negotiation to find a rapprochement in a division between our brothers and sisters. So, I thought that this chapter had much to say about seeing. It's the story, as we have had read to us this morning, of a man born blind, congenitally blind, had never seen. And his disciples, with the thinking of the day, and certainly the thinking of the scribes and Pharisees, were attributing likely that this man had sinned, and that's why he was born blind. That's a kind of a, a logical, illogical statement. Or was it his parents that were sinners, and thus they had this congenitally blind man as a son? Was that the retribution from God? Certainly the Pharisees thought this. Well, let's look at the story. Jesus says in chapter, in chapter 9, verse 3, this was specifically in the plan of God to demonstrate the fact that Jesus was indeed the light of the world as never seen before, the greatest manifestation of the mind of the Father ever to be shared with humanity. And in that light, the Pharisees lived in a world of darkness because of their prejudices. He says he had a work to do. And what was that work? It was to spit on the ground, take something from his mouth, and mix it with the clay from which all of us are descended. Adam means clay. The first man was a red man from the red clay. And he took something from the mouth of the greatest prophet of all, foretold by Moses, and he made the clay and he put it on this man's eyes and he gave him he gave him a charge. He said, go to the pool of Siloam, which probably was a significant, it was down in the low part of Jerusalem in the valley. And it was a significant journey. How did he get there? He was a blind man. He was a man, the record says, sat and begged. Well, hopefully, there were some who led him there. But he goes to the pool of Siloam, which we are told, not by accident, means sent. Well, who it was the one sent? The very one who put the clay and the spittle on this man's eyes. And he goes and he washes, and he comes back see. This is the most stupendous miracle of all. The man had no cognitive, mental experience of sight. But he comes back fully restored instantly to sight the same way you and I have right now. The question was learning to see for the Pharisees. But they couldn't see it because of their prejudices, their assumptions, their attributions, their attitudes, and their actions. And so we see the story that he is, uh, he comes back seeing, and the neighbors say to him, this looks like him. Others say, well, it is him. He was the one who sat and begged. 
And they asked him, well, how did this happen? And he says, a man called Jesus made clay. So Jesus was identified to him before, we well, don't have it in the record as, as his actual words, but he knew it was Jesus before he went and washed in the pool of Siloam. He says, I received my sight. And they said, well, where is he? Where is this Jesus? And he said, I don't know. It's a profoundly important point in the 14th verse. It was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. The day of rest. The day of God's blessing. The day of restoration in the weekly cycle that was part of Israel's life. The day of honoring God in a special way. The Pharisees then ask him, and they go through the same routine. But there's a division among the Pharisees, because some of them say, if that guy Jesus did this, he's a sinner. So this this whole thing is is you know for naught. And yet the man can see. They could see that the man could see, but they couldn't see that this was a marvelous miracle for their instruction. If they could just see Jesus, but they couldn't see Jesus as the Messiah because that would have put them out of business. Well, the story goes on. The blind man continues to claim that he had received sight by this, this man, Jesus. And so they start talking to the Pharisees, start talking, and the Jews, the Jewish people of Jerusalem, to the parents. The parents say, well, look, he's of age. So presumably this man was probably 20 years old or older. Ask him. But we don't know how this has happened. It would seem that they were afraid to say that Jesus had done this because they knew that they would be thrown out of the synagogue if they confessed this miracle to be done at the hands of the despised Jesus in the minds of the Pharisees. So the Pharisees call the man and they say, give God the praise. This man that did this is a sinner. I mean, the whole thing is mind-boggling. How could they be so blind? I mean, there's, there's nuances in this about seeing, to see or not to see, that, that are profoundly deep. And there's something there for us to learn from. They say, what did he do? How did he open your eyes? <laughs> They're totally unwilling to, they recognize that he, he now sees but they're totally unwilling to even countenance the fact that Jesus would have done this. He says, well, you know, I've told you already. And they say, well, this man is a sinner and you're one of his disciples. And so they reviled him. The man had attested to them one thing he knew, that whereas he was blind, he could now see. They seemingly could not comprehend that. And this man who had previously been a beggar, unable to see, is now a new man. He says, 
Why, herein is a marvelous thing that ye know not from whence he is, and yet he has opened mine eyes. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. This man is now a lion with courage to confront this sad and terribly distorted group of shepherds who should have been the shepherds of Israel in response to the fact that they were there in the presence of Messiah. But all they could do was to hate him. So they toss him out of the synagogue. There's a parable we all know, the parable of the prodigal man, prodigal son. And that's a terribly distorted name for that parable. Because the parable of the prodigal son is really the parable of the forgiving father who looks for him, runs out to meet him, puts his arms around him, kisses him, cries with him, gives him the fatted calf, has to, to settle issues that were unresolved with his other brother, who is in just as much trouble as the prodigal son, but in a different way, that he wouldn't even call him my brother, he called him your son to his father. Well, Jesus, in this parable, and in this incident, gives us the physical reality of the forgiving father. What does he do? Verse 35, Jesus heard they cast him out. And when he found him, Jesus made it his business to seek this man and find him. And he said, you believe on the Son of God. And the healed man who can now say, he says, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe him? And Jesus said, It's me. He says, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh to me. And the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. That's what the Pharisees should have done, but they could not. And he goes on to conclude that for judgment he had to come into the world that those that see not might see and that those which might not, which see might not uh, be made blind. Excuse me, I'm going to read that again. I'm coming to this world that they which see not might see and they that, and they, and that they which see might be made blind. And the Pharisees questioned him and say, are we blind also? And Jesus said to him, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say we see when you really are blind and therefore your sin remaineth. What's the takeaway for us? seems to me we have been blessed just like this man was blessed with sight miraculously we have been blessed of God with one of the greatest gifts that so often we take for granted and it's the gift that was given in Eden the gift of free will to choose. The gift to choose to see or not to see. It is the gift to believe or not to believe. And in the issue of difficulties between our relationships as brothers and sisters, 
it is the gift to be forgiving. God has said to us, I will never leave you or forsake you. Therefore, we ought to give them an earnest heed to the things which you have heard. So in conclusion, I would ask you to think about that sequence of those four words. That sequence of the first error in our interaction of making assumptions. The second error of making attributions. The third unconscious error that comes upon us of impacting our attitudes. And finally, the error of either inaction or wrong actions. And so, if indeed our Lord is soon to come upon us, let us do everything we can to make for peace, for justice, mercy, compassion and righteousness. For in those things God says to us, he rejoices. <laughs>